He is chairman and CEO of Beyond Health Corporation, a supplier of highly advanced health education and health supporting products. He's also president of Healthy America Foundation, national chairman of the Project to End Disease, publisher of Beyond Health News, and host and producer of the Beyond Health radio talk show. Give you Raymond Price. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, where is Phil? Where did Phil go? There you go. Congratulations on your promotion, by the way. <laughs> very nice. And, uh, and really, my, uh, my thanks to, uh, to this organization and my hat is off uh, to, to Phil and, and all the members of the team that bring you this forum. Uh, having been involved in many organizations uh, in my lifetime, I know how much work it is. It's not easy to put these things together and, uh, and present all this information to you. Uh, and they're doing it for free. They're, they're, doing, they're not charging you for it. It's a, it's a, it's a public service, and it's a, a truly wonderful thing. And uh, I just want to give my appreciation for that. And I think we should all be appreciative of it. I uh, wrote this book, Never Be Sick Again. I rather, no, no, I wrote the first book, Never Be Sick Again. This is the second one, Never Be Fat Again. And the reason I wrote that is I looked around and I saw that overweight was a problem for the American people and that overweight was sweeping the world, it's not just an American problem, it was sweeping the world at the speed of an infectious epidemic. People all around the world are becoming overweight. Americans especially are noted to be overweight. Uh, people come here from foreign countries and they're shocked, shocked to see how fat the American people are. Overweight is a disease. It is a very serious chronic degenerative disease. If you are even five pounds overweight, we can already measure biochemical abnormalities that will not serve you well. And the more weight you add, the more fat you have, the more biochemical abnormalities there are. So it just gets worse and worse. We know that people who are overweight have more of all kinds of disease. We know that overweight people die younger than thin people. We know they suffer more disability. So this is not a benign disease. It's a serious disease, and it shouldn't be there. Even our children now are overweight. About one-third of our children are now overweight. This is catastrophic. And a couple of years ago, the New England Journal of Medicine came out and predicted that life expectancy in America is going to turn down after 200 years of increases because our children are so sick and our children are so overweight. So this is a, a problem, and people ask me, they say, well, what's the bottom line? What's the bottom line? You know, what, what can we do about this? And if you really want the bottom line, I'll give it to you right now, so you don't have to stay for the rest of the talk. You can leave. Here's, here's the bottom line. The solution is to eat a lot of food. If you are overweight, just stuff yourself with food and you will lose weight like crazy. So that's the solution, that's the bottom line, that's all you need to know. Just eat lots and lots and lots of food. Now, there is a catch. <laughs> there is a catch. And the catch is that most of what we eat is not food. What we purchase in the supermarket is not food. There is no food in a supermarket. It's, it's physically impossible to purchase something that is not there. 
So we go to the supermarket thinking we're buying food, and we're not. So you can't do that. You cannot purchase processed foods. What is the cause of overweight? We know that overweight is a disease. We know that it is a serious chronic degenerative disease. What is the cause of overweight? Well, in my first book, Never Be Sick Again, what I outlined was that there is only one disease. There are not thousands of diseases as we believe. There's really only one, and that's a malfunctioning cell. All of us are made of small units of life called cells. Bacteria are single-cell organisms. Algae are single-cell organisms. We all started life in our mother as a single cell. And now we are multi-trillion celled organisms. We think of ourselves as a thing, but we're really not. What we really are are trillions of cells acting together as a community. That's what we really are. So it all comes down to the individual cell. If all of your cells are functioning normally, you cannot be sick. In fact, it is physically impossible to be sick if all of your cells are functioning normally. So if you are not well, there's only one solution. No matter what you have, no matter what diagnosis you have, whether you have a cold or cancer or heart disease or diabetes or Alzheimer's or depression, uh, there is one solution to your problem. The solution is to get well. Well, how do you get well? You get well by normalizing your cells. Well, there are only two reasons why cells malfunction. They either are not getting everything they need to function properly, or they're getting something that causes them to malfunction. And we call those two problems deficiency and toxicity. So there's only one disease, and it's caused by deficiency and toxicity. So no matter what so-called disease you may have, there's really only one solution, and that is to get well by addressing deficiency and toxicity. Well, that's the simple part. It gets a little more complicated sometimes when you're actually trying to put that to use, because there can be some pretty complex combinations of deficiency and toxicity. But if you start off simple, uh, you're better off in terms of trying to deal with your problem. So that's the problem. Well, overweight is no different than any other disease. It is a problem of cellular malfunction caused by deficiency and toxicity. And so, really, the largest single cause of overweight in our society is malnutrition. The average American is simply starving to death and they don't know it because we're the best-fed people in the world. So how can the best-fed people in the world know that they're starving to death? It's a little hard. We've got enough calories to eat. We can fill our tummies, an endless supply of food. The only problem is there's no nutrition in the food so that um, all of us are deficient. Study after study have shown that the average American is deficient in at least several nutrients on a chronic basis. If you are deficient in one nutrient, only one, on a chronic basis, you will get sick, guaranteed. Yet the average American is chronically deficient in at least several nutrients. You will get sick, guaranteed. One of the diseases that you can uh, get as a result of this, of course, is overweight disease. Now, we love to give diseases names, but again, it's malfunctioning cells caused by deficiency and toxicity. We know, for instance, laboratory experiments uh, have proven that a deficiency of calcium will cause you to gain weight. A deficiency of essential fatty acids will cause you to gain weight. Most Americans are short calcium. About 90% of the American population is deficient in essential fatty acids. 
And so there you go. Two things that we know will cause overweight most Americans are deficient in. So that's part of the problem. When you are deficient in something, there, there are two things here that you have to be concerned about. There are two controls. One of them is your appetite control. The body, um, when it's lacking something that it needs, turns your appetite on and says, please eat. And you say, OK, and you go off and you eat something. And then after the body has what it needs, it shuts the appetite off and you're not hungry anymore. When you eat a diet that is deficient in nutrients, the body never gets what it needs, and so the appetite is turned on 24 hours a day. Does any of you, do any of you people know any someone who is uh, hungry all the time? <laughs> uh, I've met a lot of people who are hungry all the time. And the result, of course, of being nutrient deficient. The other thing, the other control system uh, in the body, you know, is a self-balancing system that um, has all these very careful controls. We have to control our body temperature. We have to control our blood sugar. We have to control our hormone levels. Um, we balance all kinds of things on a daily basis from moment to moment. One of the things that the body also balances, and of course it does a wonderful job of these things, it's so well designed, um, it balances your fat. So it keeps you with just the right amount of fat. Well, that's the other control we have to be concerned about. There is a control that uh, tells the body to burn fat. There's another control that uh, switches that on, and it says store fat, burn fat, store fat, burn fat, store fat. Well, guess what? When you are deficient in a nutrient, the body thinks that you're starving to death, and it doesn't want you to starve, so it switches on the store fat switch. So when you are nutrient deficient, you start storing fat, because the body thinks that you're starving. Well, all of that uh, relates uh, to nutritional deficiency, but there is another uh, component here, and uh, I have not found this in other diet books, other weight loss books. Uh, you won't read it in the Atkins diet or the South Beach diet or any of these things, and that's the component of toxicity. Toxicity is one of the leading causes of overweight. And when the toxins are acting, even if you cut your calories, you will still pack on the pounds. Now, how many people out there have cut their calories, have done everything they could possibly do to lose weight, and they still pack on the pounds? Yeah, some of you are shaking your heads, yes, they can, you've experienced such a thing. Well, when these toxins are acting, there you go, another one. <laughs> when these toxins are acting, that's what happens. Um, toxins can actually jam your appetite control in the on position so that you are hungry all the time, and they can actually jam your fat storage control in the on position so that you will be both hungry all the time and storing fat all the time. Well, that, how can you win that one? Uh, hard to win that one. So it isn't a matter, you know, I've met so many people who, who've tried everything and, and um, they've been very sincere about it. Uh, it isn't about willpower. You know, we look at some people who are overweight and we think, well, they're just gluttonous, they just want to eat all the time, they have no willpower, they, you know. No, no, no. This is about biology, it's not about willpower. And this is what happens when you're exposed to these toxins. Your appetite turns on, and your fat storage turns on, and you pack on the pounds. Well, what kinds of toxins will do this? Well, as it turns out, there's quite a number of chemicals in our environment that will do this to us. One of them is a class of chemicals called glutamates. 
and the most famous of all, of course, is monosodium glutamate. Glutamates will jam both your appetite mechanism and your fat storage control mechanism and cause you to pack on the pounds. Where do you find glutamates? About 80% of processed foods contain glutamates. So again, there is no food in a supermarket because most of the foods in the supermarket are processed foods and 80% of them contain glutamates. Artificial sweeteners such as aspartame and saccharin will jam these mechanisms and cause you to pack on the pounds. So how many people have you seen who are drinking diet sodas because they want to lose weight or keep the weight off and guess what's making them pack on the pounds? The diet soda. There you go. There you go. So um, there are other chemicals in our environment, for instance, bisphenol A, um, which uh, you get from canned foods. Canned foods are loaded with bisphenol A, uh, and you also get from water bottles. There's a water bottle over there made of polycarbonate with bisphenol A coming out of the uh, polycarbonate. Um, we're now measuring, most Americans now have several parts per billion uh, of bisphenol A in their blood. In fact, they're measuring uh, as high as 3.8 parts per billion bisphenol A now. And, uh, and bisphenol A works at like one part per billion. Uh, it screws up your hormone system, it screws up your fat storage controls, screws up your appetite control, um, and you're just packing on the pounds. The, uh, there are prescription drugs that will make you gain weight. There are hormones, uh, uh, there are antibiotics, there's a number of prescription drugs that are known to make you cause uh, gain weight. So there are environmental chemicals that will cause you to gain weight and today these chemicals are a leading cause of the overweight epidemic. So how do you get them out of your life? Well, the simplest way of all is to eat food because most of these chemicals are occurring in the processed foods that you buy in the supermarket. If you simply eat real food, go to the, and we're so blessed here, um, we're so blessed, go to the local farmer's market, buy your food from the organic farmers, uh, buy fresh whole grains, buy fresh fruit, fresh vegetables. This is what food is. Eat food, eat as much of it as you like, and you will not gain weight. It is only when you eat garbage that you will gain weight. Where is garbage available? Simple, go to the supermarket, everything in there is garbage. So that's the bottom line. Um, native peoples who have eaten their native diets, they don't get overweight. It's only we who are eating the processed foods and eating the sugar and the white flour and the processed oils and the dairy and the excess animal protein. Uh, animal protein will make you gain weight. Pesticides will make you gain weight. And where do you get most of your pesticides? In animal protein. That's where 80% of your pesticide load comes from, animal protein. So reduce the animal protein in your life. Americans eat 10 times too much animal protein anyway. Uh, reduce the animal protein in your life and you'll reduce the prevalence of these toxins. And when you do eat animal protein, eat organically grown animal protein. So you see, it's, it's really very simple. All you have to do to control your weight is eat food and get the processed foods out of your life. If it comes in a can, a jar, a bottle, a package, a, you know, it's probably not appropriate. Probably not appropriate. What you want is something that comes from nature. That's what food is. Not only that, but that's what that gives our cells what they need on a daily basis 
and that's what gives us health. So this is not only about controlling your weight, it's about improving your health. And indeed, the only way to control your weight, the only way to lose weight, is to get well. Because overweight is a disease. If you try to lose weight, you will lose. And in fact, there's a new study just out of, um, perhaps some of you read about it, just out of UCLA. And uh, this is the largest study ever done on diets. So pretty impressive. Here's the conclusion. The benefits of dieting are too small and the potential harms too large for it to be recommended as a safe and effective treatment. So there you are. They concluded that diets don't work. In fact, doing nothing is better than going on a diet. People who go on diets actually weigh more than those who do nothing. Isn't that amazing? Almost anyone can lose 5 to 10 percent of their weight on almost any diet. The problem is you're going to gain it back and you'll usually gain back more than what you lost. And then you're into what we call yo-yo dieting. Yo-yo dieting increases your risk of heart attack, stroke, and diabetes. It doubles your risk of dying from a heart attack and increases the risk of premature death from all causes. So you cannot lose weight by trying to lose weight, and you're better off not going on a diet. Why is it that you can't lose weight trying to lose weight? Very symptom, very simple. Overweight is a disease. The excess weight is a symptom of this disease. So if you try to lose weight, all you're doing is attacking the symptom. And you may succeed in losing some weight, but the disease is still there, and so the weight will come back. The only way to get rid of excess pounds and to prevent excess pounds is to give your cells everything they need on a daily basis and keep them free of toxins. So deficiency and toxicity are the two causes of all disease, including overweight, and that's what you need to address. When you get well, the weight will go away automatically. You don't have to try to lose weight. You don't have to count calories. You don't have to weigh your portions. You don't have to do any of that. All you have to do is eat food. You can eat as much food as you like. You can stuff yourself if you wish. You will never gain weight. The only way you can gain weight is when you eat garbage. Sugar should be banned. It's one of the most toxic substances that anybody is exposed to on a daily basis. And indeed, at the very least, it should become a controlled substance and children, minors, should not be allowed to purchase products made with sugar. Minors are not allowed to purchase tobacco products or alcohol. Why are they allowed to purchase sugar, which is probably more deadly than tobacco and alcohol? So as a society, we've got a lot of choices to make here, and we have to educate people. And in my book, I devote an entire chapter to sugar and the chapter was twice as large as it is. Uh, my editors made me cut it down. Um, but you still get the gist of it even as it is. When you read through that and when you understand what happens to your body when you eat even two <coughs> teaspoons of sugar, you will never want to touch this poison again as long as you live. Eating two teaspoons of sugar is like a 50-car pileup on the freeway. Just imagine a 50-car pileup on the freeway with broken glass and parts all over the highway with the fluids leaking, antifreeze, gasoline, fires, chaos. That's what happens to you when you eat two teaspoons of sugar. And if you eat two teaspoons of sugar three times a day, morning, noon, and night, 
your body's biochemistry will be in total chaos 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and can you expect to be healthy when you're deliberately throwing all of your body chemistry into chaos? I don't think so. So this is one of the leading problems in our society is we're eating garbage and we don't know it's garbage. We all grew up with it. I, when I grew up, there was ice cream in the refrigerator all the time. There were cakes and cookies and pies. My mom made the best chocolate chip cookies in the world. Uh, we were always eating these things. Little did we know how dangerous they were, how destructive they were of human health. Well, anyway, there you are. Overweight is a disease. We know what causes it. We know how to cure it. And all you have to do is pay attention to deficiency and toxicity. Uh, and there are copies of Never Be Fat Again over there, and some <coughs> left. There's also copies of my first book, Never Be Sick Again, which has gone all over the world. People with terminal cancer, stage four cancer, have read this book, cured themselves in a matter of months. People have turned themselves around from all kinds of diseases because it's so simple. There's only one disease, there's only two causes of disease. It's so simple, anybody can do it. Uh, there's also some, I brought some, um, I was asked to bring uh, some of my coconut oil, and there is some over there for sale. It took me two years to find that. It was uh, perhaps the most, one of the most difficult projects I've ever worked on because I was calling people um, thousands and thousands of miles away who were, didn't necessarily speak good English, uh, didn't necessarily, weren't necessarily very technically sophisticated, uh, couldn't answer your questions, and in some cases really didn't want to answer your questions, uh, so, uh, or didn't want to answer them truthfully. Uh, so it was a very difficult task, and I finally found a, uh, a lady chemist um, who was an expert in coconut oil chemistry, and, uh, and with her help, I was able to find what I believe is the highest quality coconut oil in the world. So, uh, other than that. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, um, uh, I, I guess, stop talking and, uh, and take questions. Um, sir. <laughs> Well, um, you can't go by the glycemic index alone. Unfortunately, the glycemic index doesn't, doesn't really give you the information you need uh, because what that measures is what you do in a test tube. It doesn't measure what actually happens in the human body, which is completely different. For instance, uh, the glycemic index will tell you a carrot is bad to eat. You know, it's not. It's good. <laughs> eat a lot of carrots. Um, so you've got to be careful about that, but uh, you're quite correct. Um, alcohol um, does have a high glycemic index, and that's why uh, alcohol is bad for you. So uh, if you're going to consume alcohol, it should be done in moderation. And, and indeed, people often ask me, you know, do you drink alcohol? And the answer is yes, I do. I happen to uh, really appreciate good wine and uh, very much enjoy having a, a glass of red wine with my, with my meals. Uh, I don't do it all the time, but I do it a few times a week, and, uh, and I think it, uh, it's okay. But um, don't sit there and drink a half a bottle of wine or the whole bottle of wine. Uh, do it in moderation, and uh, it's okay. Uh, so uh, be careful of the glycemic index. Um, it doesn't really tell you necessarily what happens in the human body. Um, and uh, white potatoes are really not the best food. Uh, if you want to eat a potato, I eat uh, uh, sweet potatoes or yams, you know, uh, those, are, those are good, a lot of nutrition. So uh, that's what you want is the nutrition. Uh, sir. Why should we be interested in coconut oil? Um, well, coconut oil is a, a, a very good fat, um, and there's a lot of things you can do with it. You can use it as a shortening. Uh, you can use it to saute things with. 
Um, it's proven itself to be a healthy oil over the millennia. Uh, and uh, it does have a lot of very interesting properties. Uh, in fact, this lady over here talked about how she was bitten by her cat and, and got this very bad infection um, and put the coconut oil on it and it's gone overnight. Uh, so it has some very interesting properties uh, that way, very healthy. So uh, I include it in my diet. Um, it's a saturated fat, but it's a medium chain saturated fat so that um, it doesn't build up. It's, it's immediately burned. It's uh, burned very easily. So it doesn't build up in your body like a saturated fat. Uh, but it's been used in, say, the, the whole thing. You know, when I look at these things, when you get into the biochemistry of this stuff, sometimes you start getting into it and the mind just boggles. I mean, you know, there, 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 are, there are big charts that you can put up on this wall that, that tell you, you know, biochemical reactions. And you look at that and you say, oh boy, that's biochemistry. Well, you know, that's uh, less than 1% of it. Uh, and, and all these reactions, so you got a reaction doesn't, uh, you know, normally in, in chemistry, A reacts with B to get C, you know. Not in biochemistry. I mean, the reactions go this way, they go that way, they go this way, they go that way. Uh, they're going every which direction. Uh, and then your thoughts and emotions can completely change your biochemistry in a matter of seconds. I mean, you know. So with all of that complexity, what do you do? Um, my strategy is to fall back on human experience and to look at, well, what is the human experience with this? And when I look at coconut oil, it's a very healthy oil. Yeah? What about uh, some other things like uh, olive oil? Which kind? Olive oil and flaxseed. Flaxseed oil? Yeah, flaxseed oil is very good oil. What you want to stay away from is the processed oils in the supermarket. Again, go back to the supermarket, go down the aisle where the oils are, Look at all those oils. All of those oils will kill you. But it's just a side effect, so it's nothing to be overly concerned about. Um, they're all the wrong oils. They're all the wrong molecules. And, and you don't want them in your life. You know, the, 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 the canola oil, the sunflower, the safflower, the peanut, the soy. You know, all of these oils contain too many omega-6s. And when you get too many omega-6s, you cause inflammation in the body, and inflammation ages you and makes you sick. And virtually every American is suffering from chronic systemic inflammation. And we've got to stop doing that to ourselves. And indeed, uh, overweight is also an inflammatory disease. So uh, we've got to put a stop to this. And, uh, and the way to do that is to stop eating those bad oils. So flaxseed oil is very acceptable. Real olive oil is very acceptable. Very difficult to obtain, however. Um, it's, uh, when, I, when I looked at olive oil, I was so shocked, uh, I ended up writing an article on it called, called The Olive Oil Scandal, which happens to be on my website, beyondhealth.com. Uh, and the olive oil scandal is uh, uh, that more <laughs> olive oil is sold in the world than is produced. <laughs> and uh, in California, you know, we had uh, uh, the olive oil crop in California, about half of it was destroyed last year because of bad weather. But you haven't seen a shortage of olive oil, have you? <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, when I was doing my research, I, I, I'd call olive oil producers and uh, uh, and pin them down, and then they'd finally admit, oh yes, well, we, we add soybean oil to our olive oil. Oh yes, we do this. And, uh, so now I make my own oil, and uh, so um, it's uh, good stuff. Ah, sir. In my experience of raw live food, the city has a restaurant called Cafe Gratitude. Yeah. I love how I feel, I love how I digest, I love how I live, eat raw food. That's a process, I dehydrated, Yeah, raw foods, that's what you need. That's what, you know, 
I don't know where we got this idea. Whoever thought up cooking foods, I don't know. But whoever it was, if they were around, would probably have them shot. Um, it's not what you should be doing because when you cook a food, you destroy nutrition in the food and you also, depending on how you cook it, can create toxins. So uh, not what you want to be doing. I, when, I'm at, when I'm at home, I eat probably 90 to 95 percent of my food raw. Uh, I travel a lot and when you travel it's difficult to do that so my percentage of raw foods goes down when I travel but I still try to do the best I can, eat as many salads and things like that. But um, raw foods are what you want. That's where the nutrition is. Uh, sir, you were... Where would you put uh, exercise into your diet? Exercise is, is absolutely critical. Um, exercise does two things for you uh, in terms of overweight. Um, one, it helps to burn calories, so that's, that's good. But two, and more importantly, if you exercise on a regular basis, you actually reset your metabolism so that you burn more fat. And, and that's a very good thing. And in terms of overall health, exercise is needed for overall health. Now, the thing is, no, nobody, you know, people say that. Your grandma could say, you know, go out for a walk, you know, go get some exercise. Well, grandma knows best, so go out for the walk, you know. But grandma doesn't know why you need to go for the walk. Nobody ever knew why you needed to go for the walk. Nobody. It wasn't until about eight years ago um, they presented a paper at the annual meeting of the American Thoracic Society, and we found out why. Here's why. We are all made of cells. And these cells function, uh, and when they function normally, you're healthy. When they don't function normally, you're sick. Very simple. Before this paper was presented, we always thought that the one thing that had the biggest effect on how a cell acted was a hormone. Well now a hormone, what is a hormone? A hormone is part of your body's communication system. It's, it's a communication device, that's what it is. And the hormone goes to a cell and delivers a message, knocks on the door, delivers the message, and asks the cell to do something. And the cell gets the message, and it's very obedient, and it says, yes, sir. And, and it does exactly what the hormone has asked it to do. So we always thought that, you know, hormones had the biggest effect on what happens inside of cells. What we found out, much to our great surprise, is that moving and stretching a cell had just as big an impact on the functioning of the cell. That's why exercise is necessary. Unless you are moving and stretching your cells, they will not work right. And when they don't work right, you're sick. When they work right, you're healthy. It's as simple as that. So is exercise necessary? Yes, it's necessary to lose weight, and it is necessary to maintain health, and, uh, and you should be doing it on a regular basis. What study was that, Lady Milk? Can you give us the reference on that? I don't remember. It was about eight years ago, and, uh, and literally it is not in my random access memory. But, uh, it, um, it was a paper presented at the annual meeting of the American Thoracic Society. Uh, I don't know where it was published. I'm sure it was published after its presentation uh, to the society, but uh, about eight years ago. Yeah. On the toxicity side, because we're all laden with uh, heavy metals, how do you recommend getting rid of that heavy metal? Well, uh, one thing that I do recommend uh, is to sauna on a regular basis uh, and that will help you to get rid of heavy metals and then of course there are other things as well uh, N-acetylcysteine, um, vitamin C, uh, garlic, uh, eating good um, you know uh, adequate amounts of zinc and magnesium in your diet these things but uh, to go back to the sauna for a moment 
uh, saunas have now become a necessity. So it's not like you have the option of, of taking a sauna or not taking a sauna. Uh, you don't. So you have to know that. Uh, and why is that? Well, we never had to take them before, but now we do. And here's why. Because when the body was designed, it was not designed to get rid of oil-soluble toxins because there weren't any around, very few. So you didn't need to be designed. So the body never did it. Now we live in what is called the petroleum age. We are inundated in oil-soluble toxins 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, we are bioaccumulating these toxins in our body. The body does not know how to get rid of them. And they are getting, and so here's this poor little cell trying to function right, trying to keep you healthy, and you keep stuffing all this stuff in there. Well, how much stuff can you stuff in there before the poor thing just goes bloop? Well, that's exactly what it's doing. We've stuffed so much garbage in there, they're all going bloop, and we're all in big trouble. In fact, uh, fire retardants are now, we're finding fire retardants in the average American at the same level that causes disease in laboratory animals. Well, we're, we're now accumulating between three and five hundred man-made chemicals, every person, and we've got styrene, we've got, um, um, it just goes on, and, and pesticides and PCBs and dioxins and, and uh, uh, bisphenol A, and uh, I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. Uh, and what is this ha you know, what effect is this having? I'll tell you one effect it's having. One of the things you have to do, you see, the body is a self-repairing, self-regulating system. In order to self-repair and self-regulate, it has to talk to itself because it has to know when the blood pressure is a little too high, a little too low, it adjusts it. When your blood sugar is a little too high, a little too low, it adjusts it. It does everything. It always adjusts everything. Well, how does it do that? It talks to itself. Every cell in your body talks to every other cell in the body constantly. And we're talking about 75 trillion cells here, talking to 75 trillion cells. Con imagine the phone bill. Here's one of the insidious things that happens when you start building up this goop that you're putting in the cell. It interferes with the communications. One of the ways that cells communicate with each other is with light. They have many different communication systems. The hormone is one type of communication system. But cells blink at each other. And it's kind of cute. They sit there and go blink, blink and send little light messages to each other. And this is one of the ways in which cells communicate literally at the speed of light. Guess what? We now know that some of these toxins, as they build up in the cell, interfere with how far the light can travel, and in some cases, block it completely. When you start shutting down your communication system, you start shutting down your ability to self-regulate and self-repair. That's what disease is all about. You have to get these toxins out of your life and out of your body, and the best way to do it that we know of is with a sauna. And I sauna twice a week for an hour and a half. And I am burnt. You had a question.
because the blood is made white and basically electrolytes, and it's <coughs> electrolyte that everybody's now missing, and I've seen it myself and my patients with potassium. I saw it. You do need to change your water. There's no question of that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Well, um, I did look at this, and my conclusion was that the infrared was a superior way to detoxify. Um, certainly the traditional saunas did that, and, and, uh, and even the Egyptians um, used saunas, and, and even the American Indians used um, uh, you know, sweat lodges, and so um, using this type of therapy uh, goes back thousands of years. Uh, but uh, the result of my research indicated that um, the infrared was a superior way to do this, um, better than the traditional. Uh, and so, uh, and then I went out and I looked for a, a really, really good infrared sauna, and I finally found one, and I now sell them on my on my website. Um, and also, you see, you can operate the uh, the infrared sauna at a much lower temperature. Uh, and so it has less of a thermal shock on the body. In fact, I used to go into commercial saunas, and you know, you sit up here in a commercial sauna, it's like 150 degrees or something. It's, it's, uh, you can't stay there very long. So I used to lie down prone on the low bench, and that was pretty appropriate. Um, but now in my home sauna, I lie on the low bench, and it's actually 103 degrees uh, where I'm lying. And uh, so that's, I mean, that's a temperature you can see here in the Bay Area in the summertime. Uh, so it doesn't, uh, doesn't give you the thermal shock that the, uh, the commercial saunas, uh, the old type saunas uh, would do to you. And, and I think that that shock is probably not a good idea. It, it comes at a cost. I mean, when the body is forced to suddenly have to adapt to, to a change of that nature, uh, that adaptation costs you something. And so, uh, why pay the cost? Yeah, sir. Well, the steam is is good, but um, it's really not practical uh, because um, what you, what you do with that is you raise the humidity, and when you raise the humidity, the body doesn't cool as efficiently, uh, and so you can't spend much time in there. And the whole thing here is this is this is not temperature dependent. This is time dependent. See, when you're getting rid of water through your sweat glands, that's, that's temperature dependent because the, the hotter it gets, the more you sweat. That's not so when you're getting rid of your oils, when the oil glands. Uh, when the oil, when you, you heat up the, the, the fat just under the, uh, the skin, it takes about 20 minutes in the sauna just to heat up that fat, get it, you know, moving. When that starts coming out, it's, uh, the same comes out in, in, in a period of time, no matter what the temperature. So increasing the temperature doesn't help you. So w in fact, you want to keep the temperature low so that you don't get too hot and you can spend a long time in the sauna. I sauna for an hour and a half takes about 20 minutes to get the fat moving, and then I get, you know, an hour and 10 minutes worth of detoxification. Uh, and I have a wonderful hi-fi system in, in mind, and, uh, and uh, so you can listen to music, and you can meditate, and you can do eye exercises. Uh, I even read before I start sweating too much. And so a lot of things, you don't have to waste time in the sauna, you can do, you know, do useful things there. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a good thing to do. Um, Sherry Rogers, who's um, an, an MD and, and uh, an expert in, in, uh, in toxins, uh, now says that uh, saunas are a household necessity. So if you have a refrigerator, if you have a stove, you, gotta, uh, you, you, you need a sauna. Now, that's not practical for a lot of people because a lot of people uh, uh, live in apartments or, or, or homes where they don't have the space for their own personal sauna. Um, 
but we should belong to a health club or, or something else where you can sauna on a regular basis. You need to reduce your toxic load. Every American is just overloaded. You need to reduce your toxic load, and, and saunas help you do that. Uh, yeah? Great. No, no, you just do the sauna. Well, you can go. You, you can go do, but uh, you want to spend enough time in the sauna to, to get those toxins out. Uh, Phil, you had a question. Yes. Oh, they've done a lot of measurements on Yeah, absolutely. You, you lose. And in fact, the, um, um, what was it? The, uh, I forget the name of the group that, uh, um, Hubbard. Hubbard, yeah, pioneered in, in treating um, drug addicts that way to get the drugs out of their body. And very measurable. Very measurable. Oh, you were. There you go. There's a guy that was actually part of it. And, um, and, and you know that, you know, if you lower the... Yeah. Well, I was in my own wellness process. For those of you who don't know my history, um, I almost died back in 1985, um, and my death was a medical certainty. Uh, and at the last moment, I used my own knowledge of biochemistry to save my life. And then it took me two years to restore myself to where I could function once again and go back to work. Uh, and I have to tell you that saunas were a critical part of my wellness process. Uh, so it, um, you know, it's something that everybody should be doing. We are all in toxic overload. Uh, and I was chemically sensitive. One of the things that I was suffered, it was acute chemical sensitivity. I, I've only met three people uh, in the last 20 years who were more chemically sensitive than I was. So I was one of the most chemically sensitive people around. And I suffered from chronic fatigue, chemical sensitivities, three autoimmune syndromes. Um, I was very, very, very sick. And saunas helped to restore my health. There's no question about it. And today, I have no chemical sensitivities at all. I live a perfectly normal life, go everywhere, do anything. Um, and in fact, I'm getting younger and younger every year, which is what you all want to do. You don't want to get old. Getting old is a mistake. Yes, it's a mistake. We know how to control the aging process, and what you want to do is you want to keep your biological age younger than your chronological age. I just turned 70 in March. I've got my arteries now down to age 30. By the time I'm 80, I want my arteries down to at least age 20 and hopefully into the teens. Anyone can do that. Anyone. Why? The body is a self-repairing system. Our problem is, in our society, that we damage more cells every day than we repair. 
And so with time, we fall apart. And we end up in a nursing home with people having to care for us because we've fallen apart. You don't have to do that. If you repair all your cells every day, you will stay biologically young. Today, we're measuring 30-year-olds with the biological markers of 80-year-olds. What you want is to measure 80-year-olds with the biological markers of 30-year-olds. We've got it screwed up. What's going to happen to those 30-year-olds when they're 50? That's why life expectancy is about to turn down in America. So we need to learn how to keep ourselves young by keeping ourselves repairing on a daily basis. We're a self-repairing, self-regulating system. You have to keep the self-regulation and the self-repairing working properly, and then you will live a very long, very healthy life. And is it time for me to shut up? Yeah. In my sauna? Well, I don't have an infrared. I have the old. Oh, you have the old kind. Well, um, you, um, what you want to do, why don't you just measure, uh, have a, a little thermometer. Do you, do you have, can you lie on the bench? Yes. Okay. Well, put a little thermometer on the bench. And, uh, and what you, for, uh, 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 for that type of sauna, you really want it to be, oh, 115, 120 <coughs> degrees. Now, I've been in Las Vegas when it was 120 in the shade. So that's a temperature that the human body can, can handle. So about 115, about 120. Yeah, um, yeah, sure. But you have to build up to that. But uh, put your thermometer there and then adjust the thermostat to where you're getting it where you want at the bench. Good. Uh, sir. In Europe, uh, one of the alternative treatments to chemotherapy was uh, the use of Iskador, which is a mistletoe derivative, and which causes induced fevers. Do you think that that's a similar uh, kind of treatment to your sauna detoxification? Um, somewhat similar. I think, I think that saunas can actually heat parts, but particularly uh, an infrared sauna can penetrate, you know, an inch and a half into the body uh, and can produce some, uh, some nice things that way. Yes, yes. Um, so, but the conventional sauna doesn't. Conventional sauna does not. But, ma'am. A certain type of plastic water bottles. Well, all, all plastic water bottles are dangerous to some degree or another. So, um, you know, uh, but when you're dealing with the large ones like that, they're made out of a plastic called polycarbonate. And polycarbonate will leach out bisphenol A. And bisphenol A is an endocrine disruptor uh, that can really screw up your hormones and cause cancer and, uh, and other problems. Um, well, yeah, but I don't have the numbers in my head. Uh, poly, polyethylene bottles are, you know, safer than others, and, and polypropylene bottles are, uh, and even the, the um, you know, the regular water bottles, which are um, uh, triethylene, let me see, they're, they're called H PET. PET, yeah, water. polyethylene terphthalate, yeah, PET, uh, polyethylene, polyethylene terphthalate is what it called. Uh, they're reasonably safe. I mean, I drink out of them. Um, but it's really not what you want all the time. You know, as much as possible, don't drink out of plastic. And, and particularly avoid the polycarbonates because we know that those are very toxic. So. Yeah, most hotels are now uh, get water and the water is resin by PVC pipes. Uh -huh. uh, how do you avoid how do you avoid the PVC pipe? Well, what you do is for your drinking water, uh, purchase a reverse osmosis system. I happen to sell a very good one, by the way. Uh, and that will take out the bad stuff. So. When you travel, what do you do then? When I travel, I, uh, I usually use bottled water. Um, you know, if you go to a restaurant, uh, whatever. And, uh, and I try to, as much as possible, get things in, in the glass bottle, like, you know, a bottle of Perrier or something like that, uh, in a glass bottle. 
Uh, but it's difficult, you know, and, and here, you know, we poison the water. In California, we have a law that all water must be poisoned. So, um, and, and what it does, of course, you know, the fluoride destroys your brain and makes you stupid, and then you go out and vote for the guy. I don't have those in my life. I, I don't miss it. Uh, once you get away from the sugar, and once you get away from the sweets, your, your tastes change, and you don't really want it anymore. Um, I don't. I don't use it. Uh, and, you know, fruit is nice and sweet, and once you tone down your, test, your, your, your taste buds, uh, or rather rev them up again so that you can taste the sweet and the, and the fruit, uh, that's all you need. Uh, so. People, we're alert, you know, we, we're addicted to sugar. That's, most Americans are addicted to sugar, and they don't know it, yeah. Is uh, biryani olive oil considered? A yes, biryani olive oil is very much a decent brand. Yes, yes, absolutely. But it's hard to get decent brands of olive oil, very hard. Um, there aren't many around. Most, uh, you go to, you go to the, uh, the supermarket, and, and uh, there's probably no olive oil in the supermarket. No real olive oil, anyway. Okay, one, one more. All, all the things you talk about are like fresh fruits and fresh vegetables. So how does that apply to people who live in the northern climates like Sweden and Siberia, these kind of places? How does that apply to people that live there? Yeah, uh, difficult. Difficult. They just have to do the best they can. Well, fortunately today, you know, with the distribution system, they can get semi-fresh things. Um, but, um, you know, today all of the food is, is down in terms of its nutrition. Um, and I love to, say, to quote the, uh, the latest study on that where they looked at uh, vegetables and, and, uh, uh, and what's happened in the last 50 years. You know, a carrot today has 25% of the magnesium it had 50 years ago half the calcium, half the iron, five to 10% of the zinc. What are you eating? You gotta eat 10 carrots today, 10 to 20 carrots to get the same zinc you got from one carrot 50 years ago. You have to supplement. That's because the soil is dying. The soil is dying. What's that? The soil is dying. The soil, yes, the soil's gone, exactly, depleted. So you have to supplement uh, and then that's presents problems too, and if anybody's interested, I have a, a, a free report on my website. Uh, go to beyondhealth.com and sign in and you can uh, get a free report on choosing supplements that's uh, a real eye-opener. Tell you what, let's, let's have the other questions. Just come on up and talk to Ray. He'll be here for a while. And I'd like to thank you very much, Ray. It was a great job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, you're, you're a very charming man. You really make things simple. Right? It was great. And so I'd like you to have a, give a big round of applause. Welcome, Hannah. Yeah. Hannah. And, and, and I'll tell you something. Hannah. Yeah. You know, we, we believe in you know the alternative my approaches to oh, medicine. These two people, who are uh, yeah. very uh, distinguished and, and, and as students in their own right, they had their baby at home. No idea if that's a good idea, but they did it, and I think it's tremendously brave and worked out very well. So, Dave. Uh, thanks very much. Actually, there's some confusion. This is actually my grandmother after an intensive anti-aging program. <laughs> 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 um, let's see about uh, lithium. Yeah, I've been taking, uh, well, I'm trying to remember the dose, relatively small dose of lithium or a tape for about three years because it's proven to increase the amount of uh, gray matter in your brain. Uh, and it's, it's actually recommended by several different books I've read, like interesting ones. So it seems like it works, seems like it's a good thing to do. And it's very different than the chemical forms that you get uh, when you take it for you know, weird mental problems. It's sort of a trace element thing, but it's a regular part of my regimen, and uh, I'm pretty sure it's safe because I haven't gone crazy yet. Yeah. <laughs> well, how do you get it, though? What do you, where, where's um, the food you can get it from now? Uh, what he food? Said beets. He said beets. Oh, beets. Uh, I actually uh, don't mind taking like nutrients, especially um, metal-based ones or minerals uh, from pills. So when it's mixed with uh, as in the orotate form, it's very absorbable. Um, I would look for something that's chelated orotate. 
You also can't say beets have lithium because if they're grown in soil that doesn't have lithium, there's no lithium in the beets if it's grown in high lithium soil. So unless you have a mass spectrometer at home to measure your vegetables, you can't say a vegetable has high iron or high anything else. Most of that data came from studies in the 50s done from some field somewhere, and we just believe it, but it's not always true. Okay, good point. Yeah, and by the way, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the right form to take is a lithium or a tape. What, what, what is the dose, do you know, that you take? I think it's 100 micrograms. 100 micrograms. But like, don't quote me on that. I mean, I think okay. it could be wrong. Yeah. Yes. It's so, worse. the pills from uh, ERP, Veteran Research Products, they yeah. sell it. It's pretty affordable. Right. I take three of those a day. Right. Okay, VRP, and uh, that's a very good company. And uh, like, I think I have some myself, myself at home. And it, as you know, it's, it's used with a lot of success, not in every case, but in many cases of uh, bipolar, it's also used. Uh, now, of course, uh, omega-3 has really been a tremendous, spectacular success with bipolar, but uh, but anyway. Okay, next question. Yes, Ed. This is Ed Garwin. I have a hard question. I have a cat who has a protozoan infection in his gut called uh, Trichomonas foetus. And the only treatments are not very good and require very strong antibiotics. So my question is, does anybody know about that? We're trying to control it with uh, silver biotics and with charcoal. And I take the silver biotics myself. Uh, so if anybody else in the room knows about silver biotics, I'd be interested to hear your experiences. OK, anybody got experience with the with the, like coiled silver and stuff like that, right? Um, yeah. Okay. I see a lot of cats and dogs like that. And, uh, we've had success with um, using powder zeolite. As a matter of fact, they use that a lot in Canada to get rid of uh, bacteria or viruses. That's how it originally developed was dietomaceous earth and zeolite. And you can put that in there, water or food, and uh, you don't need much, you know, a quarter of a teaspoon or half a teaspoon. And it works on the gut, uh, according to Merzlo Kulik, who's the world uh, research expert in zeolite. He's done five published papers on antimicrobial studies, heavy metals, and all that. And his uh, cancer research was very well published in the uh, biotech industry in 2002 at the uh, Boston Science uh, Conference. So it's something you can look at. What kind of zeolite? Uh, you want to give them uh, the one. Uh, there's only one mine in the world that does the potassium zeolite, and that's the only one I use. Most of your zeolites are sodium form, so potassium is an anion which is essential for life anyway. So that's the one I use. Where would, where would we get it? Um, you can get me later on, and I'll give you a card. I have a, I'll, yeah. I'll, get, I'll donate one to you. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? I need okay. I would add also uh, a high dose of probiotics and coconut oil for your cat and dog yeah. because the coconut oil is yeah. fabulous. I mean, you can't even imagine the things it's done for my pets. It's taken parasites, worms, uh, all that kind of things out of the pets, as well as myself. Um, but I had a major, no, really, I take it all the time, and it gives me energy. But I also had a major uh, cat bite that I adopted, a cat from the Humane Society. And I really assumed uh, the cat had all the shots until I got bit. And it was so bad, it was so deep, and the blood just ran down my legs. The cat bit me through my jeans. So what I did was uh, I had called Raymond Francis at home, and Raymond told me to do this, this, and this, and he said, use the coconut oil. So I took the uh, 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 pan and melted the coconut oil at a low temperature, put a, put a uh, gauze in it, and soaked the gauze, put it on my leg, taped it up, and did this for three solid days and wrapped it because I knew if I went to emergency, I knew what the protocol would be, high, high doses of antibiotics. So uh, meanwhile, I called the Immune Society and they said, well, we don't test for AIDS. You don't test for AIDS? We don't test for AIDS in the cats. And I said, wait a minute, I thought everybody did. And they said, not all Humane Society. Well, yes, cats get AIDS. Yes. And I was panicking, so I figured, well, the coconut oil. So by the third day, I went to my doctor, and of course, he had uh, uh, already been informed what happened to me. So he took me, and he knew, uh, he took one look at the leg, and he says, I am totally, totally impressed. I told him I did it not only by mouth, but kept the gauze moist for three days till I came to see you, he said, because my next step was to tell you high doses of proba high doses of antibiotics and even higher doses of probiotics to protect the antibiotics. 
Okay. 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 Now, um, anybody on, else on silver? Yeah, David, just come here. Yeah. Um, back to the lithium, it was 4.8 milligrams is the dose. Okay. Um, plus, uh, grapefruit seed extract can be very helpful for the cat. That stuff is pretty darn broad spectrum, but uh, I don't know about that specific uh, organism. Okay. Well, our science advisor, Steve Fox, isn't here tonight, but I've uh, many times heard him speak uh, about silver as a, an antibiotic. Yeah. and how powerful it is and, and, and how safe it is. But the only thing that can happen to you with silver is if you take very large quantities over a long period of time, you'll actually turn gray. But other than that, it's very safe. And of course, you don't want to turn gray, so there, that is a, an inverse reaction. <laughs> but uh, depending on the colloidal particle size and how you take it. You want to I've heard this. Okay. Well, I think the, coil, the, the particle size depends on the, the permanence of potency, but I don't think it's a safety issue. Anyway, anybody else have anything on silver? Okay, uh, let's have another comment. Yes, just hold on a second. I just want to say that I use it in the neti pot to save all sinus infections. Uh huh. Okay. You use the silver in the neti pot. Five hundred parts per million. Yeah. Okay. Does everybody know what a neti pot is? It's, it's a good way to clean out your sinuses. You kind of pour it in one side. It was on Oprah uh, last week or so. Uh, I never miss this. I hardly ever miss Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when Michael Jordan is on with uh, with Charles, but I don't know if that. You got that one. I'm, diver I'm digressing. Uh, the neti pot is, is something you use to clean out your sinuses. You pour it in one nostril and it goes through the sinuses and comes out the other nostril, which of course is a little messy, but it, it's, uh, it's a terrific way to uh, get allergens out of your sinuses this time of year. And so. Uh, a contributor suggests that you can put in a small amount of colloidal silver. If you have an infection. If you have an infection. Otherwise, yeah. It's very good topically. Colloidal silver is tremendously good topically. When you had your cat bite, it had been real good. Okay, here we go, David. Sinus infections were, they plagued me for 15 years, and I have a regimen that works pretty well for it. Um, in the morning, I take a bowl of hot salt water with about four or five drops of Lugol's iodine, and I stick my head in it, and I snort the water up until it comes out the back of my throat. It's kind of the same as the neti pot, but it's a little bit more of a yoga thing. Um, that washes the stuff out and sterilizes it, and then uh, after that, I follow up with uh, Clear, which is an X-L-E-A-R. It's a xylitol-based nasal spray. Xylitol prevents bacteria from sticking to the back of your throat, and I also, to that, add some colloidal silver. Um, it looks like it works. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, very good. So, uh, what's next? Here we go. Here we go. Standards. Now, we got to limit this guy to 25 minutes. 25 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, one of my medical doctors uh, sent me an article um, from Canada. It's from uh, Canada's uh, McGill Center, which is the leading cancer center uh, in Canada. And they took a survey, I had a copy of here, of uh, the oncologist. And it was kind of a private survey, but they actually leaked out and got into the press. And it turned out that uh, uh, out of 58 out of the 64 oncologists uh, said that they would not take their own chemotherapy <laughs> if they had cancer. That's right, it says a full 90.6% of the experts said they wouldn't take it. The reason is ineffective, ineffectiveness and toxicity. Well, it got in the newspapers. So, I mean, there was an uproar in Canada, and this was on. Um, uh, this ought to occur about less than about eight, nine months ago. The other thing that came that came on the computer was very interesting. Because you know we're all interested in multivitamins and orthomolecular science and uh, taking supplements. And I had a certain suspicion as we get further into these years here, the uh, powers to be are going to squash every all our belief systems about taking any kind of supplements. Well, this article appeared just a couple of days ago, 
I said, a heavy multivitamin use may be linked to advanced prostate cancer. And, um, well, and, you know, you can take any survey. You can take any survey. And as, we all, as we all probably, a lot of us know, and you can slam these stats any way you want. And so then they, because we know, like men who think about this, about what they like to taste when they invade carotene or zinc, they said, the association was strongest in men with a family history of prostate cancer and men who took selenium, beta carotene, and zinc supplements had the highest incidences of very bad prostate cancer. So, you know, the thing is, is our belief systems are going to be challenged over the next years. Just like they are all over the, over the world, and, you know, in England, you can't go in and buy vitamins in a health food store. You can buy everything else other than vitamins. Eventually, in this country here, we already know we're leading into that direction slowly, very slowly. But, you know, it's going to be more of a challenge for all of us to really believe in our own convictions about what keeps us healthy. Because other people want to let us believe other things will keep you healthy, like pharmaceuticals, because they'll take care of us. So we've got to be on guard. We've got to stand guard at the door of our minds, as we can say. Okay, Stan, let, let me ask you a question, though. If they've got a study that shows that zinc, selenium, and, and lycopene, which are the three things which are usually considered to be protective against prostate cancer, if they've got a study that, that correlates with the higher incidence of prostate cancer, then how do you respond to that? How do you, how do you decide? See, so you say we've got to protect our waste, but you know, if we've got a study that says that, what, what, what do we do with it? Well, the whole the whole thing is is that see, no one knows how this study. Yeah. You know, who, do? who did the study? Well, who funded the study? But it, was, it was people who were voluntarily taking the vitamins because they thought they were at risk. And yeah, they were at risk. No, that's right. So yeah. this is not an even-handed study. It's, it's, it's not an even-handed study. Miserable open studies where the statistics are bullshit. The, and well, see, they took 295,000 men. And can you, I mean, how are they going to study 295,000 men over a period of time? And how are you going to study their life, daily life, uh, you know, whatever they do during the habits? And then they're all going to come up and say this? Well, they can turn, public reason, this was on Drudge Report. And Drudge goes, is a major news thing. So, you know how people are going to read this and they're going to say, oh my God, selenium, beta carotene, and zinc is really bad for prop. They'll, they'll just read that part, and that part will cause them to slowly bring down their belief yeah. systems. <clears throat> well, see, okay, but well, see, I, I give a, would you like to follow up on that? No, see, the thing is you have to take the study and look at it and figure out what's going on. And for example, um, you know, I, I'll tell you a little story. I just got back from visiting my son who lives in France and has a language school. He makes his living teaching uh, English as a second language, you know, English is really the global language now. So he does pretty well doing that. He has a very nice group of students. And uh, so he, when I was coming over, I said, well, you know, he said, I'd like you to come into the class and talk with them because they enjoy meeting new people from the States and so forth. And I said, well, you know, I don't want to talk about where I was born and what I like to do on weekends and stuff like that. How about if I come in and talk about, uh, you know, bio biomolecular medicine? vitamins and minerals and stuff. And he said, great. So I brought some abstracts. Well, one of my favorite abstracts is on selenium. So I know this, this study backwards and forwards because I read it. They, we read it in this class. The different people reading it, you know, so just practice their English. It's a study by Clark. I think his initials are W.R. Clark. Got a lot of press when it came out, I think, 1998. It's a very good study. It's in some, you know, terribly, uh, reliable scientific journal that's peer reviewed. And in that study, they found that selenium is a kind of a miracle substance when it comes to cancer because it, they, they looked at several different kinds of cancer. In, overall, the reduction in incidence of cancer uh, mortality was 50%, which is astounding. You'd think that everybody in the world would know this. Well, on top of that, the cancer that was most prevented by selenium was prostate cancer. I'll bring you a study in. I've got, I've got, I've got copies of it at home. I, I took copies to 
to France for this purpose. And I, I've got a few left, I'll make some more. And th this is a tremendously important stu study, one of the most important studies I think that, that we should all know about. And probably a lot of you do know about it. So now when I hear there's another study that shows the opposite, I'm thinking, this is really weird. So what we have to do is just what, what Ed uh, Garwin su suggests, and that is we have to look at it and see who, who did it, how was it done. There's no problem in, in looking at 295,000 people, believe me. Uh, that's, that's, that can be done. I'm going to refer to a study tonight where there's at least that many people involved. And uh, uh, anyway, okay, well now, that's, that's good. Let's see. Okay, Cardell. Would, would you say what the dosage was on the study you're referring to? Uh, I think it was... Um, Five milligrams. Two hundred mcg. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, selenium you use in very minute amounts. Two hundred, but you can use up to to four hundred a day and so forth. Yeah. Well, last month, John Gray told us that roses, fragrant roses, cure all your ills. So I brought something from the garden and you can check it out just in case. You brought that for us. Well, I'm not ill, so I, I'll, I won't take the time to sniff them right now, but, but thank you, Amy. Hey, okay, let's see. Somebody else. Okay. So, I was looking at the DCA treatment for cancer, yep. and so far it doesn't look too promising, so I don't want to uh, put anybody's hope up there. Abram Burr has been doing some work with DCA dichloroacetate. And so far on several patients, the cancer has not shrunk at all. And so I, he's not really excited about this treatment yet. And I think Robert Rowan's still in the phases that he still is not sure either. So I just want to report that out. Okay, yeah, I've heard, I've heard some thoughts about that. It's more a question. Does anyone have any experience with HALIN 951 in different cancers? What is it, Halen? Halen 951. What is it? It's a fermented soy, soy product yeah. that is supposed to be remarkable. Mm -hmm. well, let me get it. Uh, okay. No, I don't know. They probably just look it up on the web is what I would recommend. Because they usually have chat rooms for this. But some people have heard it works for it, and others is uh, overrated, so I'm not really sure. But I do want to give a plug for uh, all the videos we shoot every month. In fact, this is my 69th video tonight. <laughs> And John Gray wishes it would have been yet. So anyway, <laughs> we have John Gray from last month. I think I brought it up, and I think well, most of the 69 or 68 are there right now. For those of you who are new, remember to check out smartlifeforum.org, and we'll list all the facts and figures about our speakers, as well as the videos. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Jim. Thanks for thinking that. Let me, let me get to the announcements here. Let me see. Uh, oh, a couple other things I want to mention I saw in the paper, just to, just quickly. Uh, I went online to do some email, and, and I guess I was on the Yahoo uh, homepage, and, and one of the news stories of the day was uh, stem, stem cell study uh, brings hope for baldness. <laughs> so, so I wanted to urge you all to support stem cell research. <laughs> The other thing was, this is really strange. Uh, how many know who Mr. Roadshow is? You know, Gary Richardson, second page of the Mercury News for commuters and, and people who drive Priuses, which he drives, and so do I. So, you know, and, and there's endless discussion, funny, about uh, how to deal with the oil industry and, and so forth. It's really good. But anyway, today he, he reports, it's kind of a question and answer. The readers send in questions. and comments. And the comment from the reader was that uh, a new drug had been discovered that extends life by reducing road rage. Because road rage takes a terrible toll on you, you know, it's out of stress. And you're flipping people off. And, and, and it's not good for you. And the, the name of this drug is Flippator. <laughs> So anyway, we have more on Lipitor, by the way, later on. Okay, now the, uh, let me see what's next here. Hold on a second. Okay. Um, very happy to announce that we uh, have a new board member, Laurel Carwin, and uh, she's been a member of the uh, Smiley Forum for a long time, and now she's joining our board, and uh, she's a very powerful young woman, 
Yeah, she got her uh, degree at Stanford, and uh, then she went to Bauman College studying nutrition, got certified as a nutritionist, and she's uh, a professional nutritionist with her office in Las Gatas. So I'd like to have you give a hand to Logan. And uh, she's going to be in charge with outreach and publicity, which could be a problem because, you know, this room, we're just about to limit every time. And uh, with a little publicity, we may have to move. So if anybody's got a good idea, a really great room that's bigger, let us know. We've been, we've been canvassing possibilities. It looks like we may have to get a bigger spot. Um, okay, now let's see another thing. Um, let me see. Oh, yeah, okay. Now, uh, I'm, I'm going to give the short report tonight. You know, we have the short report in the long and the, the featured speaker. I'm going to give the short report tonight. And uh, Don always introduces the uh, short report. So I have had to subject myself to this introduction. If you can get out. Maybe you can't get out. I'll, maybe we should skip this, Don. I can get out. <laughs> I think we, are you sure we should skip this? What? We, maybe we, can we a little time to tell we should skip this? Skip what? This introduction. Uh, well, no, in your case, you need it. <laughs> <laughs> Because basically, I think to start with, though, Phil, you know, I have been much maligned over the years here. And I made a comment, I think, about a year and a half ago when Phil, Dr. Phil Miller brought out his wonderful book. And I made a comment, and he, he alluded to it in his book, that if we took carnosine, which you can buy for $26 a bottle, that will extend the average life about 12 to 22 percent. Now, <clears throat> I was challenged by some of the minor scientists in the audience, all right, and uh, <clears throat> so I went on my worldwide quest to determine that if I, that I was correct, because under the, uh, as we know, uh, it's been said that our cells reproduce about 50 times in our lifetime. And at the end of the 50 times, you know, there's a telomere at the end of the cell, and every time that cell reproduces those 50 trillion or however many there are, it gets shorter, 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 and then we die. Now, if you take carnosine, the best evidence says that instead of 50 times, it'll reproduce another 12 to 22, uh, uh, another go to 56 to 62 times, which figures out 12 to 22 times. Now, based upon my hard research <laughs> by the leading English doctor on this subject, I, many of my friends in Monterey have said that I should be nominated for something. So next week, I am holding a celebration for all of the people that have supported me through these hard times when the minor scientist said otherwise. I am I'm sparing no expense. I will be serving a dish. I have a dish full of hard sucking candies, <laughs> which people will be able to delve into. Now, uh, so carnosine, which is relatively inexpensive, is really rather magnificent. And on vitamin research products, on their website, if you look under carnosine, you'll find the study that is listed there. Now, one other point, which might be of interest, because I've read, and perhaps you've also read, we all, all know people with atrial fibrillation. Isn't that correct? <clears throat> now, I have it. The doctors told me I thought I was pretty healthy when they told me I had it. Boom, I went, I went off the track because that really shocked me. And I've since read where about 60 plus percent of the people over the age of 60, 65 have atrial fibrillation. Oh, that would be premature for you then. Uh, that would be premature, that's absolutely right. And so, as a result, I have a, a friend of mine that was a nurse's instructor in the Bay Area for a number of years, and that's all she taught was nutrition to nurses. And she said, Don, do you know about Dr. Koji out in the valley? This is in Carmel Valley, down the area in which I live. <clears throat> and I says, yes, I play tennis with Koji all the time. And she says, he has cured two, and they use that word cure very tightly, cured two people that I know of atrial fibrillation who had serious atrial, atrial fibrillation. I says, is that really true? What does he do? He says he literally just goes into the vagus nerve, which goes from the medulla oblongata in the brain down the back and down the front, 
and it gives you the acupuncture. So I went to, I went to see Dr. Koji, and um, I, I suggested that he do the same thing to me. Now this man, all of the hospitals in Chicago almost 30 years ago requested that they want to know something about acupuncture. So they sent a team of people to Japan. They went into the Japanese teaching schools, and here was this man who taught. He's a fourth degree karate black belt competitive champion, wonderful individual, went to Chicago. The day that he landed in Chicago, the Chicago Tribune said, uh, Japanese witch doctor arrived today, okay? <laughs> Spent about six years there teaching acupuncture, then went to Europe teaching acupuncture, and he's down now on the Monterey Peninsula. So I went, and all he did, if you, anybody, how many of you people have had acupuncture here in the room? Well, we really do have a group of weird people. Okay. And so, so he was prodding me, you know, prodding me, and then in the other room I heard strange noises, and I said, what's going on in the other room? And he said, no, no, just something normal. I said, no, I think there's some sex going on there. I said, the whole sequence sounds like sex to me. Okay, but anyway, I, I went through the whole routine. I took three sessions. And for some reason, I go back to my doctor, he says, I can't hear a thing. So I said, well, the next time I want an EKG, I want to make sure that it's not there. But he says, that's strange. He says, you may have the answer to it. And I asked Dr. Koji. Dr. Koji says, hey, Don, it's all, it's all the time. And in most cases, it'll work. He says, Western medicine don't under doesn't understand it, but who knows? Anyway, so with that, uh, any of the people taking notes? You know, actually, sometimes I feel it's like standing up here, it's like urinating in the wind, you know? <laughs> Nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. But tonight, we're very honored. We have a man, we have a man here, and we all know Phil Jackman, the president of our organization. When he, you know, I think I once told you, when I was young, my mother says, Donald, you're going to be president of the United States. I said, yeah, Mom. Every, every, son, every mother told his son they're going to be president of the United States. Well, with Phil, his mother didn't tell him that. His mother told him that he was 24th in line to the British crown. <laughs> now, anybody that understands history, and I was always kind of a history nut, knows that if you are in line to the British crown, the pretender to any crown or any throne, I always read in the things that they all had handmaidens. Now, I was young. I didn't know what handmaidens were for, what they did. And, uh, and as a person, nobody had ever date me in high school. Nobody had ever go to go. And so I always, I always wondered, what do handmaidens do, OK? Now, unfortunately for Phil, unfortunately for Phil, Queen Elizabeth will not expire, OK? <laughs> Now, fortunately, we got rid of Fergie. Fergie's gone, so. And then there's poor Diana. And now there's some upstarts coming along. But three of them are gone. Three of pretenders are thrown. So you're now down to 21, Phil. So literally, what we have tonight in front of us is royalty. I notice that you are treated with the same disrespect at times that I'm treated by some of the minor scientists that are sitting here who said that if you took carnosine, your life would not extend enough another 12 to 22 percent. So I would like to introduce Phil because here's a fellow that has done so much for our group and I think all of us know and all of us realize that, my God, for $60 a year, we sit here and we listen to geniuses week in and week out, and, and it's absolutely amazing. I was in an office yesterday, and literally, I'm talking to nurses who are brilliant. I have two children in medical school, one about to graduate, one just starting in medical school, and I'm talking about things, and they're dumbfounded. I'm trying to do it in a non-confrontational way, and they're literally dumbfounded about what I'm talking about. I, they said, would you mind sending me some of this material? One was a doctor, two other nurses. It, so it's there. It's because of brilliant students like this man right over here that has contributed so much to our organization. And so tonight we're elevating him from a minor scientist to a major scientist. So Bill, will you come up and...
that guy's amazing. That guy's amazing. I gave, I gave all kinds of you know stuff where you can do respectable uh, introductions, but he, he, he just ignored it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, well now, I uh, did a lot of work on this talk. I really got into it. It was just very exciting for me, but I realized at the same time it was a short report, and the short reports are supposed to be 10 minutes long and 10 minutes of questions. So I actually put it on, I printed it out, I, 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 and I wanted to make sure everybody has a copy. Maybe we could spend a little bit longer than 10 minutes because Ray uh, very generously said it'd be fine if we go just a little bit longer, but I want to make sure everybody's got a copy. Here, here it is right here. Yeah. Would you mind passing me that? Okay, hold up your hand if you can get one. And, uh, okay, let me see. Maybe we can get some more here. Uh, summary of the whole talk. And uh, as you can see, the, uh, the project of the talk is to address the question, who can we trust? And uh, of course you can ask that question when you talk to a financial advisor. You can ask that question when you're trying to find a good lawyer. Hopefully you won't need to find a good lawyer. And you can also ask that question when you have a medical problem. And uh, of course the usual answer is, gee, this is nice. Who brought the water? Yeah, our, our favorite lady. Well, that's not water. <laughs> Whatever it is, I hope it's good for me. <laughs> that's what handmaidens do. Oh, I see. <laughs> but I hope that's not all they do. <laughs> anyway, okay. So um, the usual, the usual answer that, that every practically every American gives uh, is that you you ask your doctor. I mean, that's what they tell you to do on TV, isn't it? You know, if, if you have a medical problem, you ask your doctor. And it turns out that, and this is my first point, it's a good idea to think for yourself and not rely exclusively on your doctor's advice. Now, there's a couple reasons for that, and I mean, those of you who are veterans already know what they are, but let me just briefly state what they are, easy enough to say, and easy enough to show too. And the first one is that doctors are not well informed about biomolecular medicine. They don't know a lot about vitamins, minerals, hormones, um, iodine, colloidal silver, things like that. And uh, there's a big contrast between pharmaceutical medicine, which is 99% uh, xenomolecules, by which I mean molecules which are foreign to the body and which um, have various effects on the body, of course, where they wouldn't be interesting. But most drugs are xenomolecules, and vitamins and minerals and nutrients which we find in our food and molecules which our body itself produces, like CoQ10, for example, or testosterone, these are molecules which are essential to the biochemical processes of the body, and they can also be used by supplementation as medicines. So there's that fundamental contrast, and I put those two words up there once again, Linus Pauling, when he talked about orthomolecular medicine, was talking about biomolecular medicine. I, I prefer the word biomolecular medicine because I think it's intuitive. Well, when you hear orthomolecular, unless you know the history of that term, you don't know what it means. But biomolecular is kind of self-explanatory. Well, so the first reason why it's not a good idea to rely exclusively on your doctor is that your doctor doesn't know a whole range of treatments. Because what doctors do, most of them, of course, there's a lot of good doctors that part of this group who are do integrative medicine and combine the two. But what doctors do mostly in America and across the world is they prescribe drugs and um, set people up for surgery. So they do drugs and surgery. Now the second thing, the second reason why it's not a good idea to rely exclusively on your doctor is that this is a real shocker and it's almost something that's hard, very, very hard to believe, and we could talk about why it's hard to believe, but the second reason why it's not a good idea to rely exclusively on your doctor is because your doctor is not good at prescribing drugs and surgeries. They don't know which drugs are best, and they don't know what surgeries are best, and when they're appropriate. And then you say, 
Phil, how can you say such a thing? But we all depend on doctors, and what, what would we do without them? Well, now, folks, let me just briefly direct you to page two. And on page two, you find an excerpt from uh, last month's uh, Nature, Nature magazine, which is, of course, revered and loved by people who love science. British journal, British magazine. And it's a commentary uh, on uh, adverse drug, drug reactions, or as they call them, severe adverse drug reactions. S-A-D-R, this is the abbreviation. By the way, the way they determine if it's severe is if it requires hospitalization. So severe adverse drug reaction is one where the person takes the drugs and, and, and in accordance with the doctor's instructions, but he still has an adverse drug reaction. And, uh, and so there's statistics, there's three statistics that I wanted to call your attention to, which I put on the front page. You can see this for yourself. You can take a look at that second page at your leisure. But the three statistics are, one, that in the United States there were a million of these the last year. There were 100,000 deaths. And 19 drugs, which they, in this article, list, uh, you can go online and, and get it, or email me and I can forward it to you. 19 drugs approved by the FDA in the last 10 years have been withdrawn, including the notorious Vioxx, which, as you probably remember, um, is a drug that caused clotting, and instead of being protective, it was, it was given for arthritis pain. And, and, uh, and it did a fairly good job at that, although not better than aspirin, it turns out. But it was supposed to be better than aspirin because it didn't cause so much bleeding, which is kind of iffy. But the big news about Pyax is that it causes clotting and caused, therefore, between 120 and 160,000 heart attacks and strokes additional over and above what would be expected and it was found in a non uh population. And of those, that great number of strokes and heart attacks, 40% of those people died. And those statistics were given by uh, David Graham before the Senate. So, so that, I think, just begins to perhaps raise a doubt as to whether doctors really do know how to prescribe drugs and surgeries. And we didn't get into the surgeries, but we can do that at another time. Now the, now the question tonight is, though, okay, if we don't want to rely exclusively on our doctors, where can we go? Now, you know, at one point we thought about trying to have the Smart Life Forum website a kind of place to go for this kind of information. But board members pointed out that, well, it's all on the web already. And the big problem is this, to figure out what to believe on the web. In fact, you know, if I didn't know Don Southern, I'd think he was full of baloney when he talks about curing atrial fib with uh, acupuncture. And even now, of course, I want to see the science, but I'm willing to, to take a good look at it, to tell you the truth, because I know Don is not putting us on. And, you know, I, I, I've, you know, been around Don for 10 or 15 years now, so, you know, when he says these things, they sound crazy, but, I, you know, the most, he, he, he doesn't BS, he doesn't have to, he's got, he, he, the, the reality is funny enough for him. <laughs> but anyway, um, Bill? Yeah, Tom. Every time they release a drug, a scientific study put out by the pharmaceutical industry, so that would make me very happy. <laughs> Good point, but the thing is, of course, I've got a whole bookshelf of, of, of books on the way the pharmaceutical industry works. Believe, me, believe it or not, I must have 10 books. And you know, they suppress data, they do all kinds of stuff. They get fined right and left for all kinds of things. It's an incredible catastrophe. In fact, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna say all it is a catastrophe because I don't, they think they'll say, well, oh, this guy's just far out. He's just down on doctors or something. Who knows what his problem is? I wanna show you examples, and I won't, but more than that, as someone said, light a candle. Light a candle, don't just curse the darkness, light a candle. Well, it turns out that, you know, this talk is lighting a candle, but somebody has lit in a giant candle. And that somebody is Consumer Reports. Remember, you all know Consumer Reports. <clears throat> want to buy a car? Want to buy a used car? Want to buy a refrigerator? Want to buy a tent? Want to buy a, a camping stove? It's all in here, right? 
And before them, there was another group of, another couple who were lighting a very bright candle. And these, these are the couple by the name of Joe and Teresa Freud. And they've been writing books called The People's Pharmacy. And now just last year they came out with this book, Best Choices from the People's Pharmacy, which I really like because, you know, I don't want just more information. I want to see people, I want to know what is the best choice? What are my cho what are the choices? You go to the doctor, the doctor says, take this. You don't know what the hell it is or what it's likely to do. He gives you a lot of things, a lot of small print. He doesn't give you choices. He doesn't say, you know, some doctors might say, give you some options, but for the most part, they don't. And if they prescribe a drug, they don't say, well, now there's three, these three drugs here we can give you. you. You know, we can think about which one is best for you. But in this book, by Groyden, who's a uh, pharmacist, he puts side by side the various drugs and non-drug treatments, and he rates them for 24 different health conditions. And it's fabulous, just fabulous. It's great reading. It's it's just a marvelous book. And the only thing wrong with it is that it's it's very very good, and will cover probably two thirds of the problems and questions we have. But it's not complete yet because there's all kinds of other health problems. And but now it enters the field, and this is the other great source that I wanted to refer you to. In answer to the question, where can you go for evaluations of treatment options? The other great source is that now uh, Consumer Reports steps in. But before we, before we get to that, let me just direct you to page um, three, which is the page on uh, the Gruden's, it might be Graydon, I'm not sure how he pronounces his name, I've never heard it pronounced. How do you think it's pronounced, Graydon? Graydon. Graydon, okay. Joe is an MS, I guess, in pharmacology, and Teresa's a PhD, and I don't know why. But anyway, look at, here's the chart. Here's here's some of the things that they write in the book, which are just so to, much to the point. Let's just please read with me this first paragraph at the top of the page. We all make decisions about what movie to see, what car to buy. Surprisingly, when we have more information to help us make these choices, surprisingly, we have more information to help us make these choices than we do about our health care options. We can check movie reviews from trusted critics or consult Consumer Reports magazine for the best buys on toasters, mattresses, or automobiles. But where can you find objective information about the best way to treat, ar treat arthritis, high cholesterol, or migraines? And, of course, what they'd set up to do then, provide information. Now, what, ha what has happened in just the last two years, and I don't even know, very few people really are, are alert to this yet, Consumer Reports has gotten into the field and they're doing a tremendous job. And my main thing that I wanted to, to communicate to you in the short report is check out the Consumer Reports website, the Consumer Reports Medical Guide.org website, which we'll get to in a minute. But the important thing to realize is that when you have a health problem or a health project, either one, you always have choices. And that you should be a part, you should be a party to making those decisions. That you, you have a right legally. The doctor is not your trustee. He doesn't, you do not sign power of attorney over to him when you walk into his office. You become, you remain the decision maker. And therefore, it's important that you get the information. If you walked in, if you walk in to invest $100,000 with a financial advisor, do you, just sit, do you just sit back and say, tell me what to do? And walk out and do it? No. You want to know what the options are, you want to know why he's recommending, what he's recommending, and so forth. You should be at least as careful about your health. And now, with a little help from the internet, you can do just that. So now turn to page four. <clears throat> and uh, when you go on the Consumer Reports website, you will find a little uh, uh, place to click, a little, little place to, to link to their tour, it says take this tour. So you click on take this tour, and what you'll find are, are these words. And they, they have now provided four different kinds of um, information. And the four kinds are listed right here, treatment ratings, drug reviews, best by drug recommendations, and natural medicine ratings. Natural medicine ratings which rank, rank the safety and effectiveness of over 14,000 herbs, vitamins, and natural supplements. Now I have to tell you, I haven't gotten down to that part of it yet, but I have used the part on drugs. 
uh, because in preparation for this report, we'll come back to it later. So, so what I wanted to uh, tell you is, I wanted to alert you to that and to make sure that you uh, don't forget it. I've, I've included some of the pages so you can see what it looks like. But can you imagine? Consumer Reports is one of the most important institutions in America if you're a rational consumer and, and you, if you want to be an informed consumer. And now they're in the medical field. And it's my hope and, and prediction that Consumer Reports is going to be the end of Big Farm as we know it. I, I, I think it's that important. Yes, David? Forty years ago, Dr. Bernie Galler at the University of Michigan told his class, which included yours truly, that in five years, the computer would assist the doctor in diagnosis and prescribing because the human mind can cope with two or three variables. The computer can cope with hundreds. Now, it's, what in the hell's happened? 40 years later, why why has that not happened? We've got the computer capability. Yeah. Can anyone tell me? I, it, yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. amazing. I mean, computers are extremely, you know, well applied, shall we say, in, in most other fields. I mean, it didn't take real estate, which is not nearly as important as health. I mean, it's, it just governs real estate now. It governs the travel industry. And, and you talk about variables. How many variables are there when you're trying to plan a trip? But I think it's going to happen. And when it does happen, the scam that has been perpetrated on the American public by the pharmaceutical industry will come to an end. And believe me, it's, it's, it's you know how skeptical I am about Big Pharma. I, I, I keep hitting on Big Pharma. And, and we hadn't noticed, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, somebody said, well, you know, Phil, we've heard that, it's the old news. I said, yeah, I'll stop talking about it when people stop dying. And that's, that's my answer. You know, you don't stop talking about the Vietnam War until people stop dying. You know, I'm not going to start talking about Big Pharma until people stop dying. And, and you think if I'm exaggerating, you've got the nature excerpt, but wait till you see the piece de resistance, which is this thing I did on the, on the, uh, uh, the best-selling drugs. As a matter of fact, let's go there right now. Now this, this I think, uh, Bob? I'll bring Mike over, Bob. You didn't answer the gentleman's question. You see, computer work on the ego principle, garbage in, garbage out. And we do not have proper inputs to put in. And uh, let me show you something that the, the basically science, you know, we need the chemistry for doctors and dummies. We don't have it. And this is what the science, where the science is. Science is lost. We are in the Copernican world positioning science, you know. The, we, we don't have the right data. Okay, very good. Very good. Uh, by the way, this is one of the, you know, about one of the many brilliant physicists in the group, you know, and, uh, and so he, he knows what he's talking about. He's got, a, he's got his own very interesting and very powerful critique of, of uh, quantum physics that uh, is, is quite extraordinary. It's PhD in physics. It's Slack, and, and there's, there's all kinds of people here, you know, who are working on this together. And, and, and you know, that's part of the answer that they haven't done most of the research that's done on drugs is done by the drug companies. So it's very hard to, to figure out what's going on. But there's enough research that is done independently that you can get some pretty amazing results. And so what I decided to do is just an exercise, because I don't want to just rank people. I want to show, I want to show the facts, is take a look at the best-selling drugs, the five best-selling drugs. And so I went on uh, imshealth.com, which you can all do. And I found that in 2006, the five best-selling drugs were Lipitor, Nexium, the purple pill, serotide, which are actually a, a combo drug that was a, is a derivative of serotide called, uh, well actually serotide is the combo drug. Serotide, its other name is Advair, for asthma, Playvex, an antiplatelet, an anti-clotting drug, and Norvasc. 
And now I'm not going to, because you know we don't have time to go over this in detail, but I want you to read it because it's absolutely, I, I, I'm stunned at the results. Uh, the five best-selling drugs, every one of them is a disaster. I don't think, I know that many drugs are valuable. I take another drug, which is recommended by Consumer Reports, by the way, for asthma. And I'm not against drugs. I also take Depernel, which is a drug, as a, as a uh, anti-aging uh, medicine. So I'm not against drugs. And I'm not against doctors. But if you look at the best, at the top five, it's a disaster. Let me just briefly run through it. Lipitor, you know, is a statin. Statins are disastrous, not in themselves so much, but because they're always prescribed, almost always, without CoQ10. And without CoQ10, they're a disaster. Nexium is a disaster. It's a tremendously powerful acid suppressor. You take Nexium and your body just shuts down. Why do you suppose there is stomach acid? Do you think it's a mistake of nature? Or do you suppose it has something to do with health? And what do you suppose happens to your health if you shut it down completely? And a very good book that spells all this out is uh, Jonathan Wright's book, so take a look at that. So Nexium's a disaster. And anyhow, it's not about acid indigestion, because older people have too little stomach acid, not too much. And acid reflux is not due to too much stomach acid in the first place. It's due to a leaky sphincter right here in the esophagus, which has to be dealt with, you know, that problem has to be dealt with. The problem is not too much acid. So suppressing acid, although it will prevent acid reflux, since if, if you turn off acid production, there won't be any acid to reflux. But there also won't be any acid to digest your food. You won't have B12, you won't have calcium. David had told me that the baby has to get home early. Thanks, David, for bringing the baby over. Congratulations, Anna. OK, then the, the asthma drug, Number three, the study came out, and uh, I, I quote the study here. You can look this study up. Just plug it into Google. Come up. It turns out if you take this drug, more people who take this drug die of asthma than people who have asthma who don't take the drug. <laughs> Playvex is, uh, there's two studies there, again, that show that aspirin is just as good, if not better. So it's not the drug, it's not the drug of, of choice. It's not the best treatment. And then lastly, Norvask, which um, is, is <laughs> kind of my all-time favorite in a way because it really, it, we have the best knockdown, decisive, end of the discussion research on Norvask. Not only is, are there non-drug treatments for high blood pressure which are better, which I, which I indicate here, but when they did one of the rare studies of drugs, head to head, side by side, to see which is best, and this is the LHAT study, A-L-L-H-A-T, as you see here on page two under Norvask, number two, the antihypertensive and lipid lowering treatment to prevent heart attack trial, that comes out to be LHAT. This is a study, the government spent $120 million, eight years, 42,000 patients, at 600 clinics, and what they found was that the water pill that had been around for 50 years, the diuretic, was as good as Norvask and better at preventing death. It was as good at lowering blood pressure and better at preventing death. And the water pill cost $20, $40 a year, and Norvask cost $800 a year. Now, here's the point. Hundreds of thousands of doctors wrote millions of prescriptions for Norvask. Did they know what they were doing? <laughs> so they didn't. So I'm telling you, and this goes back to the main point, which of course I'm lecturing to the choir, but on the other hand, <clears throat> I hope that you can use um, some of this information to talk to the people you love and maybe get them off of the idea that their doctors know what they're doing and open them up to some science, because I think the Smart Life Forum and the members of the Smart Life Forum are really, in a way, representatives of science. Our little voice in our, in, in our own families is a voice which is saying, hey, look, the American public is the victim of a gigantic, multi-billion dollar <laughs> scam to sell drugs. And it's worse than, than, it's worse than I thought. Until I did these five 
stop selling drugs. I, you know, e even, as I say, even I was stunned and shocked. And a little bit disappointed because I wished that a couple of them had turned out to be good because I don't want people to think that I'm an extremist. <laughs> but all five of them were lousy. Now, that, as I say, not all drugs are, are bad, but, uh, but those five are. So give copies of that to, uh, to your friends and see, and see what kind of response you get. Yes, ma'am. Like that. Yeah. Interactions are very important. And by the way, Consumer Reports has 